say you look radiant this morning. Perhaps you say you look beautiful this morning. And you smell lovely. How are you doing this morning? Wonderful. I'm not talking like, how you doing? You know, Joey from Friends. How you doing? Marvelous. Marvelous. You see, what I'm getting at is, how are you doing? Not in terms of, I'm feeling fine, but how are you doing in terms of assessment in your life? How are you doing this morning? You see, some of you might be thinking, I'm doing really well, actually, if you want me to assess my life, because I've got a great job, I've got a great car, I've got a lovely husband, or a great girlfriend, or a wonderful cat, a Persian, something like that. I'm doing pretty good. You see, it's difficult sometimes to assess that question, how are you doing, because some of you are maybe thinking, well, I don't know. I don't know. I need some money for the trip next week and it's not coming yet. So I don't know. You see, I think it's a really, really difficult question to answer. How are you doing? Because what's the benchmark for an assessment? How do you truly know if you're doing poorly? Or how do you truly know if you're doing great? So when I ask you, how are you doing this morning? We need a framework. We need something upon which we can assess accurately. Because if we define it on what the world says is accurate, maybe that may not be true. Oh, I'm talking spiritual, aren't I, today? Golly, I'm talking a bit hypothetical. You see, today is Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday is all about purpose. You see, if you want to get an assessment of your life accurately, you need a framework. And the framework that I want to tell you today that's useful to have is purpose. Understanding your purpose and having a correct understanding of what purpose is. You see, once, I've got, once you've got that framework, then I think you're going to be in a position to be able to answer that question. How are you doing this morning? Has anyone ever read the book Purpose Driven Life? 40 days, one person, two, three. It's like an evangelism conference, four, five. That's wonderful. It's a good book. Rick Warren's worth getting. Have a good read through it. 40 days. You normally start in Lent and, and finish in Easter, but you can do it any time. The reason why I like it is because he puts this quote in. The purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment. Your peace of mind or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet... You must begin with God. You were born by his purpose and for his purpose. And if we use that as our defining criteria, if we use that as the benchmark with which to assess the question, only then can we work out, perhaps, how are we doing this morning? The first time I read that quote, and I'll read again, the purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you are placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by his purpose and for his purpose. You see, when I read that the first time, I didn't like it. it didn't fit comfortably with me. It sort of went against my grain. What do you mean that my life isn't about me? Of course my life's about me. If it's me, it's my life. I'm the one breathing, I'm the one thinking, I'm the one talking, I'm the one annoying you with this voice at the moment. <laughs> you see, it's about me. What do I want to be? What should I do with my life? What are my goals, my dreams, my ambitions, my dreams for the future? 
And if you haven't asked those questions yourself, then you're probably not normal. In fact, our culture thrives on purpose. Our culture celebrates purpose. But the problem is it's often at odds with what God's idea of purpose is. You see, you are judged successful if people can see purpose being manifest in your life. And purpose is defined pretty much as what car you drive, what job you do, what bank balance you have, how pretty you look. How many friends you have? If your house has got a big deck. Apparently when I came here from England, we didn't have decks in England. I have bought a house and I said, what can I do to make some money back on this house? And they went, put a big deck on it. <laughs> so you know what I did? I put a big deck on it. I've not sat on that deck once. Mainly because you have the winters from hell here. But other than that, I haven't even been on this deck. Yet apparently that's worth something here. The next thing I have to get apparently is a barbecue to put on it. One you use gas in. We never use gas in barbecues in England. That's probably why we're all ill. But anyway, God sees things differently than we do. What I love about this Palm Sunday text that's been read to us today is the story of the colt, or let me use a Canadian word, a donkey. There's this little old insignificant donkey that is essential to the purposes of God. Something that the world would perhaps say is insignificant, has little or no purpose. But God sees things differently. And we read that the Lord instructs his disciples to go into a village ahead of him. And there he gives them a prophetic word, a word of knowledge, that they will see this colt tied up, this little donkey tied up. One that's never even been ridden. A donkey that hasn't even fulfilled its worldly purpose. Where I want to take you today is answer this question. Are you in danger this morning of never fulfilling your purpose? Because God has a purpose for your life. You might not see it at the moment, but he has. This story Jesus tells his disciples to untie it. To bring it to him, and if they're challenged by anyone there to respond that the Lord needs it. God had a use for that donkey. It was designed to be ridden. More than that, it was designed with a purpose, and the purpose of this little, tiny, insignificant, unused, tied up, chained donkey was to carry the King of Kings. To carry the Messiah. Who'd have thought that about that little old donkey? Pretty much left alone. No one bothered it. Hardly got fed. No one could see its potential. But Jesus could see its potential. And Jesus can see your potential today. You see, some of you almost certainly will be here. And you'll be questioning your purpose. Maybe some of you here will be at the place in your life where I've been, where you perhaps thought, I haven't achieved much. I haven't done much. And if I compare myself to that beautiful person next to me, you know, my life's been insignificant. My life doesn't seem to match up. I remember once when I got down to nothing. All I had left was 38 pence in the bank. That's about 70 cents. And I thought, this is a pretty low point. But then I remembered I can still breathe. I can still talk. I can still think. There's still stuff to be grateful for. Yet I might not see my purpose yet. I might not see the future yet, but I know a God who can. And this morning, if you're feeling a little bit low, 
Let me tell you that Jesus is here. And he can see the next day. He can see the week ahead. He can see what donkey might be tied in the village in the future you're just about to walk into. He can see the opportunity that lies ahead of you that you can't see yet because you can't see the future. God knows the plans and the purposes he has for you. Just because you can't see doesn't mean God isn't with you. Just like Jesus knew where the donkey was, he knows exactly what you're facing at the moment. Exactly what you're going through and exactly what the outcome will be. For some of you, it's cancer. For some of you, it's poverty. For some of you, your family members struggling. For some of you, your relationship it is breaking down. For some of you, your sibling is on the run. For some of you, whatever it might be, Jesus knows about it. For me, I very much wanted to have a successful worldly career. And, uh, and I trained in television in media and communications. I've got a fabulous job working uh, for a, a television company in London that gave me a platform to move to the BBC in, in London and start climbing up the career ladder uh, to, to find fame, to find fortune, because that at that time is what I thought was important. But then God started to show me his I remember volunteering at a new church plant and helping out on a Friday night at the youth club. And all of a sudden, something started to change. That when I was sitting at my desk on a Monday morning at the BBC, instead of normally plotting how I was going to crush my opposition and climb up the ladder, all of a sudden I started to be concerned about what good youth event to put on for Friday. How are we going to get little Johnny saved? How are we going to get Joanne and her sister who are struggling with their parents who are in a marriage breakup? How are we going to get them into church and into relationship? My priorities started to shift. In fact, what concerned me was the fact that if we all died tonight, would all my friends and family be going to heaven? And all of a sudden that became a new paradigm for me. Say paradigm to someone. Paradigm. Lovely word. I think you lovely words. Things started to shift. Priorities start to change. And all of a sudden, I ended up giving up my job. Giving up where I lived. Moving in with a stranger so that I could learn how to tell people about Jesus in a way that is hopefully effective. Started to lead people. Seeing lives transformed. I want to read to you a few verses from Mark. A passage about a rich young man. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony, don't defraud, honor your father, your mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. <clears throat> Jesus looked at him and loved him. He said this, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. At that, the man's face fell. He went away sad. Because he'd got great wealth. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. You know, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's a really interesting story. 
Because I think this rich young man was earnest in his pursuit of God. He came and he fell on his knees in front of Jesus. I think he genuinely wanted to know and to serve God. God, Jesus identifies himself as God. He sets a new framework for this man. And all of a sudden, because this man, he was benchmarking himself. He had a framework like Jewish people have that we don't have. They have the law, the Ten Commandments. He could test himself for those things and think, I'm doing pretty good, but I'm just going to check. And when he went to Jesus, he realized that that wasn't good enough. That actually the paradigm had come in. There'd been a paradigm shift. You see, for Jesus, Jesus says, yeah, you've done everything right. Well done. But the weakness in your life is that you're relying on wealth. You don't give it away. Does that mean we can't be rich? No, of course not. That was his crux. That was the area in the life that he didn't really want, want to surrender to Jesus. Some of you this morning, there's an area in your life that you don't want to surrender to Jesus. Let me challenge you to surrender that to Jesus. Because if you trust him, if you trust him with that one thing you don't really want to give him, that one part of your life you don't want him to have access to, if you trust him, he'll make a way. See, the disciples trusted Jesus. They went on ahead to a strange town. They probably thought, boy, what is Jesus on about today? There's going to be some donkey tied up. They went. Sure enough, there was a donkey tied up. Sure enough, it had never been ridden. Sure enough, someone asked them, what are you doing without what the Lord needs it? The Lord needs you this morning. What he needs is for you to surrender. Now it might be that you're already on track with your purpose. It might be that if you're studying for medicine, that's exactly what we want you to do. But if he asked you to give it up, would you? If he asked you to leave your family uh, and friends behind and move to do something, would you do it? Challenging questions. The challenge for the rich young man was, would you give up your wealth? He went away sad. You see, what we find on Palm Sunday is often a clash of purpose. You see, for the Jews at the time, they were expecting their Messiah to be a great chosen military leader, someone who would come into town waving an axe, waving a sword, who would free them from Roman opposition. That was what they were expecting of their great Messiah, the one who'd been foretold for centuries. But when Jesus came, things were different. Yes, they were praising him on Sunday. But in a week's time, they were crucifying him. See, I actually think that Palm Sunday is probably the most challenging service of the year. Are we ready to trust Jesus? Even if it looks unusual. Even if it looks different to what we expect. Because when the king came on the donkey, he wasn't carrying an axe. He wasn't carrying a sword. He wasn't going to take on Caesar. But he was going to win the battle. He was going to win the war. And he was going to do it through suffering. He was going to do it by self-sacrifice. The ways of God can sometimes be a mystery to us. But we can always trust the purposes of God. This morning, if you will trust God with your life, if you will trust God with that thing that seems unfathomable for you, if you will trust God in that area of your life you don't really want him access to, he'll come through for you. The 
real miracle occurs when we trust Jesus. And those disciples who did trust him, even though it looked like it was all over in a week's time, and we'll find out about that next week. Three days later, victory came. You might not see it yet, but trust God and victory.